Good evening. I'm Joshua Johnson. It's Wednesday, June 29th, and here's what we're talking about tonight. Some legal experts say yesterday's January 6th hearing could put former President Trump in trouble. Meanwhile, some Secret Service agents are apparently claiming Cassidy Hutchinson had some of her facts wrong. We'll have more from Capitol Hill. A lot of state laws are in flux after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Tonight, we'll focus on Georgia, where a six-week abortion ban could soon be enforced. Meanwhile, some pregnancy counselors in Texas are giving out some stunning misinformation about abortion. We'll show you what an NBC News investigation turned up at a so-called crisis pregnancy center. Also, Israel is getting ready for its fifth election in just over three years. What does this mean for President Biden's upcoming visit? And a California town took beachfront land from a black family. It took almost a century, but this week, they finally got it back. The January 6th committee is laying out what happened on that fateful day and why. Today, there's more fallout from the latest hearing. That one may have offered up the most damaging evidence so far. Yesterday, you may recall, we heard from Cassidy Hutchinson. She worked for White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. She testified that President Trump knew violence was possible that day and did nothing to stop it. Now, two details from her testimony are drawing criticism. The first one, her claim that the president got physical when a Secret Service agent refused to drive him to the Capitol. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. Ms. Hutchinson made it clear that she heard this second hand through sources who were apparently reliable. But NBC News has been told that two witnesses are prepared to testify under oath that this did not happen. The second detail in question is this handwritten note, quote, Anyone who entered the Capitol without proper authority should leave immediately, unquote. Ms. Hutchinson testified she wrote it, but former Trump White House attorney Eric Hirschman says he did. Meanwhile, today the committee announced it has subpoenaed former White House counsel Pat Cipollone to testify. Cassidy Hutchinson testified that he demanded that the president stay away from the Capitol. Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of, Please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen. Let's bring in NBC Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa to break it all down for us. Ali, what's next in terms of who we might see as witnesses going forward? Yeah, Joshua, there are still several people the committee is very much interested in speaking with after yesterday's uh, testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson. Of course, uh, there's former White House counsel Pat Cipollone, who we heard mentioned so many times during Hutchinson's testimony as someone who really opposed what he was seeing and hearing in the White House before, during, and after January 6th. This is someone we know the committee has spoken with privately a couple months ago, uh, but really wants to come out publicly and boost what we heard from Hutchinson yesterday. Yesterday, but he's concerned over really privacy issues and executive privilege issues about his uh, former conversations with the former president. The committee is still very much interested in speaking with him, delivering really a not so veiled invitation at the end of yesterday's hearing for him to come out and publicly testify. And so that's something we're definitely watching is whether they finally make the move to come out and subpoena him to come testify. Another person they're interested in speaking with is, of course, Hutchinson's former boss, former White House Chief of Staff, Mark Mark Meadows, but this is obviously someone who's been willing to face uh, possible criminal charges for not complying with subpoenas that the committee has sent to him. So that is highly unlikely that uh, Mark Meadows will eventually uh, come and speak publicly before the committee. And of course, then there's Ginny Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas's wife, Ginny Thomas, who said two weeks ago that she would be willing to speak with the committee. And now her lawyer is coming out and saying that he would need more reasons from the committee to justify uh, Ginny Thomas sitting and 
and testifying either privately or publicly before the committee. Uh, he's saying that really, uh, he there, he's saying, quote, there is no story to uncover here, and until the committee comes out and gives him more reason uh, to change his mind, really, uh, Ginny Thomas is still a no-go, Joshua. There was some fallout after Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony regarding her account of what happened in the presidential limousine in the motorcade on their way back to the White House, where she claims that the president basically lunged at the Secret Service agent who was driving and threatened to kind of commandeer the vehicle from him. How is the committee responding to the pushback to that piece of her testimony? Yeah, and remember, this was a story that ha Cassidy Ch Hutchinson testified under oath that, that she heard uh, from a former head of security at the White House who heard it from a Secret Service agent. So really a game of telephone here. Uh, but Cassidy Hutchinson is saying that she remembers it clearly. And now you have Secret Service agents, as you mentioned, anonymously disputing this claim, uh, coming out and saying that it did not, did not happen, even though we know the Secret Service agents did speak privately and testify privately before the committee. Despite all of this, the committee is still standing behind Hutchinson and her testimony, saying she is still a credible witness uh, that we heard from yesterday, Joshua. One more thing. Uh, uh, the co-chair of the committee, the vice chair, Congresswoman Liz Cheney, issued a warning basically about witness tampering or witness intimidation near the end of the hearing. Here is part of what she said. This is a call received by one of our witnesses. Quote, a person let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal and you're going to do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. I think most Americans know that attempting to influence witnesses to testify untruthfully presents very serious concerns. We will be discussing these issues as a committee, carefully considering our next steps. With regard to that, Ali, what might those next steps look like before we go? Yeah, that was really a surprise we heard at the end of yesterday's hearing. Uh, the committee's top Republican, Liz Cheney, saying that they these witnesses are getting uh, phone calls, text messages, emails uh, from uh, from former uh, former colleagues in some cases, uh, Trump supporters, and really the concern with the committee is that this will uh, intimidate witnesses and perhaps make them uh, present false testimonies before uh, the committee, the American public, and we know the DOJ is also watching. So the committee is saying that this is something they're seriously discussing. What is involved in those discussions, we still don't know yet, but that is something that we expect them to talk about until these next few hearings pick up roughly around the second week of July. We expect two more hearings at the end of this, Joshua. Thank you, Ali. That's NBC's Ali Rafa starting us off tonight from Capitol Hill. The end of Roe v. Wade is already creating a patchwork of laws from state to state. A number of so-called trigger laws would effectively ban abortions almost immediately in a handful of states. Courts are temporarily blocking trigger laws in Utah and Louisiana. Meanwhile, Georgia does not have a trigger law, but there is still a bit of uncertainty about what's next. A law restricting abortion rights is still tied up in the courts. Back in 2019, Georgia's Governor Brian Kemp signed a bill that would basically ban abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. Last summer, a federal judge struck that down. The state appealed, and now the U.S. Court of Appeals delayed its decision pending the outcome of the Supreme Court case. Joining us now is Dr. Julianne Burt. She's president of Radiant Women's Health in the Atlanta area. Dr. Burt, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. If this law that's now tied up in litigation prevails, if it stands, what would that mean for your practice and for the women you serve? The heartbeat bill has, since 2019, been a hard pill to swallow. We know as gynecologists and women's health specialists that oftentimes women don't even know that they're pregnant until well after their first or second missed, um, missed menstrual cycle. So for my patients um, and, and for the community at large, this is a huge disappointment um, because 
our patients, oftentimes for whatever reason and for various reasons, may consider terminating their pregnancy. Um, and so it, it's it's really disheartening um, because uh, you know the conversation is now no longer just between my patients and myself. I have justices in the room. I have other ears in the room, and that's just not right. Georgia's maternal mortality rate is higher than the national average. Approximately 29 Georgia women per 100,000 live births die from pregnancy complications. The national average is about 17 women. So I can imagine that if this law prevails, it would have some very serious real world impacts. Tell us a bit about the clients that you serve, the people who would be impacted by this. What walks of life do they come from? Are there any demographic trends among them? Describe your, your patient base to us. Right, so my practice is on the outskirts of Metro Atlanta. And I take care of women who um, are well-educated. I take care of women who um, have a high school uh, diploma. I take care of women who, you know, make six figures. And I take care of women who, you know, rely on assistance um, from our government. So, you know, I'm also a part of the, um, of many groups and organizations and namely, the National Medical Association. And I'm thinking, you know, Joshua, we are convening in Atlanta this summer in about 30 plus days. And that organization, um, our goal is to help not only physicians who are made up of African descent, but the patient population, the patients who are underserved, they are underrepresented, they are, you know, they, they lack either lack health insurance or they just don't have enough health insurance. And in the state of Georgia, you may know that there are more than half of our states don't have appropriate care for um, the obstetrical patient. So now we're going to add another burden on top of that, another burden on top of that. And, you know, it, it really is, you know, a difficult time. I remember when I heard the, about the leak um, last month, that whole week was difficult for me because I just kept thinking about my patients. And unfortunately, yeah. people think about, they think about patients using or abusing, you know, the, the this procedure, this medical surgical procedure, and they don't think about the other women. And it doesn't matter her reason. It doesn't. And as a woman, I am offended that someone else wants to come in the room. Right, right. I wonder, I know I gotta let you go in a second, but I've spoken to a number of anti-abortion activists over the last week or so. And several of them have said that they believe that this is an opportunity to provide women a broader array of, of prenatal counseling, whether it's adoption services, counseling them through how to you know, decide to expand their family, possibly even donated services to help with some of the costs of caring for children from infancy to even the first few years of their life. Do you see any room for that or, or does your service provide that now? Is there any room for that kind of service provided that Georgia's law perhaps takes effect? Oh, I've already warned my staff that our doors will probably be, you know, get knocked down because, you know, patients, I, I have a vast uh, array of age groups as well. And I do still serve, service the young women, but mostly women in their 20s are the ones who um, opt for uh, terminating a pregnancy. But there was a study that I just looked at out of the University of California, San Francisco, I believe. And it shows what we've been taught for 20 years and that most women do not regret their decision. And I was a teacher before I was uh, became a physician. I educate my patients at their wellness exam. It's an opportunity. We talk about reproductive health. We talk about sexual health. We talk about you know trying to uh, protect against sexually transmitted infections and unwanted pregnancies, but it is still her body. 
and it is still her choice. So yes, there, an opportunity is there, of course, um, but it's almost as if they're saying that we weren't doing our job from the beginning, and that is just not it. Dr. Julianne Burt of Radiant Women's Health, appreciate you making time to tell your story to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now to an NBC News investigation on crisis pregnancy centers. These facilities are all over the country, offering free help dealing with unplanned pregnancies. But CPCs do not offer abortions. Nationwide, they outnumber abortion clinics roughly three to one. Many are funded by religious groups. According to the Associated Press, at least 13 states have spent a half billion dollars on these centers, Texas clearly chief among them. Well, the NBC News Investigations Unit wanted to learn more about what they do, and we zeroed in on Texas, where there are nine times more CPCs than abortion clinics. Counselors there implied an array of untrue things, among them that getting an abortion would cause mental illness, infertility, even cancer. Again, none of those things is true. NBC senior investigations and legal correspondent Cynthia McFadden has the story. We're heading to a crisis pregnancy center in Texas, one of more than 2,500 in the country. They say they provide free services and abortion information for pregnant women. What they don't say is that they're often affiliated with groups supporting abortion alternatives. Here. To learn more about what happens inside, we sent in two NBC News producers to ask for pregnancy counseling. At a center in the Dallas area, a volunteer told our producer they don't offer abortions, adding abortions can cause infertility. When asked about the abortion pill, the volunteer said, my job is not to scare you. You never get over seeing that baby. She then pointed to a small plastic model like this, saying, can you imagine one of these in your panties? Oh, my gosh. <sighs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so as a taxpayer, this is infuriating. A horrible thing for a woman to be told, and medically totally inaccurate. Yeah, and as, a, a as a nurse, as a mom, you totally shocked me with that. It's a lie, and it is shaming, and it is, it is grotesque. Texas State Representative Donna Howard, a Democrat, found an unlikely ally in former Republican State Representative Sarah Davis. So anyway, They're calling for these nonprofits to be regulated oh, and demanding accountability for a program called Alternatives to Abortion, which helps fund crisis pregnancy centers. In Texas, they outnumber abortion clinics nine to one. When I say alternatives to abortion, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, waste of money, waste of taxpayer dollars, lack of accountability, and actually no metrics that indicate that it has anything to do with averting abortions. It's just a program to make Republicans feel good, like they're doing something to help women. Does it help women? No. The program will cost Texas taxpayers $100 million over the next two years. This is probably the only program, at least that I'm aware of, where the legislature basically writes a blank check without knowing what they're getting. While some of the centers provide free services like diapers, ultrasounds, and STD testing, none of the Texas facilities are licensed medical providers, though some women report believing that they are. At another center our producers visited near the border, a female staffer implied abortions can cause cancer and infertility. She then played a video saying they also cause mental illness. All of that categorically false. Alternatives to abortion in Texas has also received federal tax dollars, $45 million over the last 15 years. Money intended is temporary help for needy families. These are desperate people who need these funds. And instead, it's going to a program that provides things like pamphlets, that provides some classes. Would you go so far as to say that in some instances, they are actually committing fraud? Yes. Yeah. They point to the misinformation and a case currently being investigated in which state funds from the program were allegedly used by the president of a center to buy land for hemp production. Who's to blame? 
Well, the legislature, yes, but the leadership that we have in this state has pushed an agenda that has made it impossible to have any real dialogue about what is really going to make a difference in the lives of these women and their families. That was NBC's Cynthia McFadden reporting. Still to come, Israel is getting a new prime minister. We'll have the latest on this government shakeup. Plus, R. Kelly was sentenced today for sex trafficking. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. In a few hours, Israel's parliament will dissolve again. That will trigger the country's fifth election in less than four years. Israel will also get a new prime minister. Yair Lapid is set to lead the parliament, called the Knesset. He will take over from Naftali Bennett. Mr. Lapid will hold the position temporarily until this year's elections, and Mr. Bennett says he will not run for re-election. In two weeks, President Biden will meet with the new prime minister. He'll also visit the West Bank and Saudi Arabia as part of his first presidential trip to that region. Let's discuss it all with Daniel Shapiro, a former U.S. ambassador to Israel. Today, he is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you. So what was going on in the Knesset before this fell apart? Was it kind of clear that things were unraveling, or did it happen kind of in a flash? It was a government that was teetering from the moment it was established a little over a year ago. It was a strange concoction, uh, a collection of eight parties that totaled exactly 61 seats. That's the bare minimum necessary to form a government in Israel. And they spanned a very wide ideological range, far right, far right to centrist, to far left, and even for the first time in Israel's history, an Arab party participating in the government. And almost from the beginning, those internal tensions uh, made the government uh, very difficult to manage. Uh, opposition parties tried very hard to pick off votes on key legislation. Uh, so it was, uh, in some ways, very impressive. And in some ways, they exceeded expectations that the government lasted one year. Uh, this was the government that uh, Naftali Bennett, who's appearing on your screen now, served as prime minister, and Yair Lapid, who you mentioned, uh, is about to uh, become the acting prime minister. The two of them really were the architect of this uh, strange, uh, unusual government. And uh, it's not a surprise that it didn't last very long. Uh, it, for many Israelis, it's a quite a frustration, however, that, as you said, they're going to their fourth election in less than uh, their fifth election in less than four years. Yeah, and in previous cycles when we've been talking about this, we were talking about the former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He was removed from office a year ago. He's currently f trying to fend off corruption charges. Will he play a role in whatever is going to come next with Israel's parliament, or is he kind of off the scene for now? He's not off the scene at all. He's the opposition leader. Uh, he's the leader of, in fact, the largest party in the Knesset, the Likud Party. Uh, and he will try to lead that party to victory in the election this fall. Uh, and then he will try again to form a government of 61 uh, seats. He has failed to do that on four consecutive elections, and that's uh, caused some frustration within his own party. There are those in his party who say, you've had your turn, uh, let somebody else lead, let somebody who isn't burdened by uh, the corruption trial that he's facing uh, and some of the personal uh, uh, controversies associated with him over his long 12-year rule as prime minister, uh, let somebody else who would be able to form a government. There are right-wing parties who are in the outgoing coalition uh, who ideologically could easily sit in a, uh, par in, a in a government led by the Likud party, but whose leaders, because of their own personal histories and their own objections to Netanyahu's conduct, refuse to sit with him. So he'll be in the on the field. It's not clear if he uh, if anything has changed or if the same kind of stalemate that uh, resulted from the previous four elections could result from the fifth. How does all of this factor into President Biden's visit? President Biden planned this visit uh, many months ago. He told then Prime Minister Bennett that he would come to visit. Biden uh, is a longtime supporter of Israel, and uh, I think it was important to him personally fairly early in his presidency to make this trip uh, and show that this alliance is one that he cares about and is invested in. So the trip was already planned. Then the government fell. Uh, and there's no reason it can't go forward. Now, acting Prime Minister Lapid will receive him, and he'll conduct all the same 
business that he would have conducted. It's so far before the election. I don't think anybody can fairly uh, suggest that he's interfering in Israeli politics by doing it. His agenda really doesn't change at all. Uh, it's about promoting Israel's integration into the region, which has been made possible by the Abraham Accords, the normalization agreement between Israel and several Arab states, to try to ease uh, tensions and improve conditions between Israelis and Palestinians, uh, to try to uh, upgrade U.S.-Israel security cooperation and link that to a broader coalition of countries all connected to the United States and integrate their air defenses and, uh, and their military uh, capabilities and to prepare with Israelis and work with uh, Arab partners in the region for the next phase of the nuclear talks with Iran, whether that produces an agreement or whether that produces a breakdown. So the agenda is the same agenda. And before I have to let you go, what about what the Israeli people want? Is this inability to form a government a reflection of division within the public, or is there a political disconnect there? It's very much a reflection uh, of a closely divided society. Uh, between right and left blocks, uh, because so many Israelis vote for uh, smaller parties who represent a particular sector of the society. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to create a, a, co a, co a cohesive coalition. Um, uh, so in many ways, the, this uh, series of elections and series of stalemates is quite reflective of where Israeli society is. Uh, some of that is attached to the person of Benjamin Netanyahu, and it might be interesting if you were not uh, on the field to see if that would uh, change the dynamics. Um, some Israelis were very attracted to what this outgoing government achieved, this broad, diverse array of parties uh, who disagreed on many subjects but managed to work together and achieve some meaningful things. Uh, but I'm, I think it is actually uh, a fairly accurate reflection of where Israeli society is at. Daniel Shapiro, former U.S. Ambassador to Israel. Ambassador, thanks very much. Thanks, Joshua. We will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including today's Supreme Court ruling about crimes committed on native reservations and sentencing day for R. Kelly on charges of sex trafficking. Tonight's headlines begin with the Supreme Court. Its term ends tomorrow. And today, it issued another key ruling. This case involves crimes that happen on Native American reservations. Today's decision narrowed down a ruling from just two years ago. Here's NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams. The court today scaled back the effect of its own ruling two years ago that had blocked state authorities in Oklahoma from prosecuting some crimes that occur on Native American reservation land. Today, by a five to four vote, the court said Oklahoma shares jurisdiction with the federal government for crimes committed on reservations by non-Native Americans against Native victims. The decision narrowed but did not completely overrule the court's ruling just two years ago that involved jurisdiction over crimes on tribal land. As a result, only tribal or federal courts can try cases involving Native American defendants who commit crimes on reservation land. But this restores the authority by the state on other crimes on the six reservations in the eastern part of the uh, state of Oklahoma, and that includes much of Tulsa. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who wrote the majority opinion, said that Native American reservation land is part of a state, and that gives both the state and the federal government concurrent jurisdiction to prosecute crimes committed by non-Native Americans against Native victims. We learned today that the court will hand down the rest of the decisions from this term tomorrow. So we're waiting the court to say how much authority the EPA has to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants and whether the Biden administration acted properly in trying to shut down the Trump remain in Mexico policy at the southern border. And because the court issues the last rulings tomorrow of this term, Justice Stephen Breyer will formally retire tomorrow at noon. His successor, Katanji Brown Jackson, will then be sworn in at the court and will take her place as a Supreme Court justice. Joshua. Thank you, Pete. That's NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams. President Biden is at the NATO summit promoting more security support for Ukraine. Today, he pledged that the U.S. will increase its defenses in Europe. In a moment where Putin has shattered peace in Europe uh, and attacked the very, very tenets of rule-based order, the United States and our allies, we're going to step up. 
Meanwhile, NATO has formally invited Finland and Sweden to join the alliance. NBC White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has the latest on that. Kelly, good evening. Good evening, Joshua, from Madrid, where President Biden has been involved in the NATO summit, and this has been an eventful day. Organizers of this gathering of 30 nations are talking about how the defensive alliance is changing, growing, and repositioning itself for the future. And one of the biggest ways it's doing that is expanding the partnership itself, extending an invitation formally now to Sweden and Finland, two countries that have long been neutral in the neighborhood of Russia and now have asked and have been accepted to, to join NATO for the future. And that is a direct response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Sweden and Finland see a vulnerability and want to be a part of this defensive pact. So that is now officially moving forward and it will be ratified by all the member countries. Also, the U.S. is a big part of expanding the American footprint in the eastern part of Europe, close to the border with Russia and Ukraine. And that is a part of something we've seen ramping up in the months of the Ukraine war. At first, President Biden sent additional troops to partner and ally friends in Europe. And now he's making some of those military positions more permanent and, in the words of officials, more persistent. A permanent base in Poland and rotations in other countries along the border that will extend the American presence and fortify the alliance, helping NATO and also sending a message to Russia. That's been a big part of what has happened here. The meeting of the leaders has also included a one-on-one -on -one with President Biden and Turkey's President Erdogan, who was instrumental in finally lifting his objections to the expansion of NATO. The president also had time to meet with South Korea and Japanese leaders to talk about North Korea, a threat that has not gotten as much attention in this time of the Ukraine war. And President Zelensky is expressing his concerns. He did so virtually by addressing the leaders here, saying that he wants them to understand the threat is real for those beyond Ukraine and urging NATO to consider what it can do to help Ukraine, if not adopting Ukraine into the alliance, which is not on the table presently, doing more to try to help them defend themselves against Russia. There's one more day in this conference, and we'll be following all of it for you. Back to you, Joshua. Thank you, Kelly. That's NBC White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell with the latest from Madrid. R&B legend R. Kelly could spend the rest of his life in prison for decades of sexually abusing his fans. His attorneys had asked the court for a 10-year sentence at most. Today, a judge sentenced him to 30 years in prison. Last fall, a Brooklyn federal court convicted him on all nine counts. Prosecutors accused him of targeting an array of young women, including the late R&B singer Aaliyah. For years, R. Kelly fought and beat these allegations, but popular opinion shifted in the resurgent Me Too movement and after the documentary Surviving R. Kelly. A statement from Brooklyn's U.S. attorney reads in part, quote, I hope this sentencing serves as its own testimony that it doesn't matter how powerful, rich, or famous your abuser may be or how small they make you feel. Justice only hears the truth, unquote. R. Kelly did not speak during today's hearing. His attorneys say they will appeal the sentence. More charges are pending in Minnesota and Illinois. Coming up, a unique kind of reparations in Southern California. A black family will get back a prime piece of beachfront property that was taken nearly 100 years ago. We'll explain just ahead. Stay close. Here's another beach to add to your California vacation to-do list. Bruce's Beach. It's in the city of Manhattan Beach near Los Angeles. This prime beachfront property has a troubled history, one that's finally being addressed. Bruce's Beach is named for Willa and Charles Bruce. They bought the land back in 1912 for just over $1,000, transforming it into a thriving seaside resort for black families. But they, like many black homeowners of the day, had their property seized by the city back in 1924. Officials said it was to build a public park. In California, land means wealth. Officials say that land is now appraised at $21 million. Imagine the generational wealth taken from this family for nearly a century. Now, they will start getting it back. Yesterday, the LA County supervisors voted to give Bruce's Beach back to the Bruce family. Today, it has a lifeguard facility on it, but the deal, 
calls for L.A. County to lease the space annually for $413,000. Joining us now is Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn. She represents a district that used to include Bruce's Beach, and she co-authored the resolution to transfer ownership. Supervisor Hahn, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. It's really nice to be with you. Before we talk about the transfer, let's talk about the beach. If we were to walk on that beach, what would we notice? What would we see? What would stand out? This is probably one of the more beautiful beaches uh, I would say in California, you know, crystal clear ocean, lots of white sand, a uh, boardwalk that people stroll on and bike on, a lot of surfers, and you will see million dollar condominiums and homes uh, that sit right along what we call the Strand in Manhattan Beach. So this is not just some corner of the beach kind of away from the shore. This is, is valuable real estate that's, I imagine, going to mean a lot to the family that's reclaiming ownership. This is prime beachfront property. Talk about the backstory of Bruce's Beach and what that meant to you in terms of sponsoring this resolution. I mean, the history of the way that this land was taken is, is really pretty awful. This is really a story of uh, such atrocities and injustice, not just to uh, the original owners, Willa and Charles Bruce, but to generations of Bruce's who most certainly would have been millionaires uh, now if they had been allowed to hold on to this prime beachfront property. In 1924, Willa and Charles Bruce purchased uh, two plots of land right on the ocean and then went on to build a very successful beach resort. It was called Bruce's Beach Lodge, where people would come and dine and dance, and there was even a changing area. They rented swimsuits. And of course, in the 20s is the time here in California where African Americans were not allowed to have a day at the beach at very many locations. I can only think of two in our vicinity. One was Bruce's Beach, and the other was Inkwell Beach and Santa Monica. So African Americans from all over South in California would spend the day driving to Bruce's Beach, enjoying themselves, and really um, doing what most of us take for granted, which is just having a nice day uh, at the beach. But soon, the city of, of Manhattan Beach became alarmed uh, that it was so successful. And they attempted to run out uh, Willa and Charles Bruce just by pure harassment and dirty tricks and putting no parking signs up. The Ku Klux Klan actually was involved in torturing, uh, you know, the family by setting mattresses on fire uh, underneath the resort. And they pretty much wanted to make it miserable, not just for Will and Charles, but for every African-American that was enjoying yeah. their day. At the and then when that didn't work, uh, they decided, decided to take the property by eminent domain, and they used the law to virtually steal the property from Will and Charles Bruce under the guise of yeah. creating a public benefit, a park, which uh, didn't happen for 30 years. So this parcel so, of land, and this isn't a this isn't a huge plot of land. As I understand, it's about seven thousand square feet, like a fifth of an acre of land. Just by way of contrast, this building, Thirty Rockefeller Plaza, by itself is about two and a half acres. So this isn't a vast piece of land. But what message do you hope it sends that the county is returning this land to what would have been its rightful owners? Well, I think it was really important, for me anyway, I grew up in Los Angeles and I was under the, you know, misguided impression that we didn't have these kinds of stories in Los Angeles, that these uh, stories of atrocities against African Americans only happened in the South. But when I finally realized that those two pieces of property that were taken uh, from the Bruce's almost 100 years ago now belong to the county of Los Angeles, not the city of Manhattan Beach, but the county of Los Angeles. And when I realized that we now owned it, my initial reaction was we need to return this property to the remaining heirs of Willa and Charles Bruce if they're 
even allowed if they're alive, even if they're, you know, are they still with us? And so um, I actually was put in touch with the great, great grandson, Anthony Bruce of Willa and Charles. And I will tell you that first phone call I had with him was so emotional for him because he said this um, taking of that property nearly a hundred years ago had torn their family up decades later. Family reunions were, you know, kind of ruined uh, when someone would bring this story up. And he even told me that his great, great grandparents vowed to get that property back. Um, sadly, they both died before they ever saw uh, the possibility of that happening. So for me, the message was, it's never too late to right a wrong. And it's not a gift of public property or public land. We are returning stolen property. And it has had such a great ending. And I hope, uh, because we were the first uh, government agency in the, in the country to return property to an African-American family. So I'm hopeful that other counties yeah. across our country will look at what we did and follow in our footsteps. I appreciate one thing in particular, Supervisor. I know I got to let you go, but I appreciate the, the thought process that you described in terms of thinking these kinds of things couldn't have happened here and being able to grapple with that kind of history. I think that's a conversation that's happening in a lot of different places, and we'll, we'll see how it turns out in other spots. But for now, I'm looking forward to my next trip back to Southern California. Cannot wait to see Bruce's Beach for myself. L.A. County Supervisor Janice Hahn, we appreciate you telling us the story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great being with you. Up next, heading back to the moon. The Kennedy Space Center is gearing up for NASA's Artemis program. We'll see the first part of our feature report before we go. And a final word from the last man on the moon. I'd like to just let what I believe history will record that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. That was astronaut Eugene Cernan from Apollo 17 back in 1972 taking his final steps on the moon. Americans have not been back since. NASA scientists hope to change that very soon with its Artemis project. It's an ambitious three-part mission building on Apollo's findings with more sustainable technology. The first launch could happen as soon as August. Tonight's feature report takes us inside Artemis. It's absolutely fascinating when you think about the technology that the Apollo teams utilized. That's one small step for man. Not only on the ground, but on the spacecraft, on the Saturn V launch vehicle, pushing the boundaries of technology. One giant leap for mankind. They got on these things and they learned to go to the moon and travel in space when we didn't know if it was possible. The benefit we have, you know, following in their footsteps is to learn from what they did and build on it with the technology we have today. So Artemis is all about NASA returning to the moon, but this time in a sustainable way. The directive I'm signing today will refocus America's space program on human exploration and discovery. It marks an important step in returning American astronauts to the moon. Somehow Artemis has managed to survive the switch from a Republican president to a Democrat president, which is quite unusual, and it maybe shows the strength of the program. When the Artemis mission was first proposed a few years ago, uh, and they touted a 2024 lunar landing, I think a lot of people were a bit uh, incredulous, didn't think that would happen, but things seem to be kind of surprisingly on track. Artemis is, is a very aggressive program, and we're at the, the final operational point. We're about to move and see the SLS rocket and Orion launch crew for the first time here in the next couple of years. We were meant to see SLS launch already by now. Initially, the rocket rolled out to the pads uh, a month or two ago and we were expecting a launch maybe by May or June. Unfortunately, a few issues have delayed that launch, and it's now looking like it's going to be maybe towards the end of the summer. But you know, SLS is a cornerstone of NASA's Artemis program. So the Space Launch System, the SLS, this is the most powerful rocket that 
um, exists on the planet today. When you look back and compare it to the Saturn V rocket, it may be a bit smaller and a, a bit shorter, but it uh, it's more powerful from a from a liftoff thrust uh, than the Saturn V was. And what it really boils down to is the ability for us to take bigger and heavier payloads to the moon. The SLS is made up of several pieces. On either side of the big orange section of the vehicle are our solid rocket boosters. Then in the middle orange section, that's your core stage. And beneath that are four main engines for the core stage. Above that is our interim cryo propulsion stage. Um, that is our upper stage that will basically take the Orion spacecraft and the service module to the moon. That's what allows us to leave Earth's gravity and go to the moon. Above that, we've got our service module provided by the European Space Agency that basically has an engine on it, breathing air, all of the things that Orion spacecraft needs during its mission. Above that is the Orion spacecraft. That's where the astronauts will ride when we get to Artemis II. And then above that is the launch abort system. And that's the pointy piece at the very top. And it's used in the emergency condition if the Orion capsule needs to be pulled away from the rest of the rocket during flight. It's been pretty widely derided. It's very expensive. It's very over budget. It's very delayed. Yes, SpaceX can maybe do it cheaper with their Starship rocket, but that is still an unproven rocket, as is SLS. So having these two options on the table does give us a bit of redundancy. It does allow us to kind of plan having a lunar program in the near term. So at the end of the, the shuttle program, as we ramp down from shuttle, we're looking for uh, what does NASA do in space and how do we get to the destinations we want to go to. And NASA started focusing on the deep space missions, so how do we get to the moon and Mars and beyond. You know, what does a spaceship have to look like to do that? So we came up with a capsule design similar to Apollo. These are still the best way to get humans back through Earth's atmosphere. I mean, these re-entries are, are very hot. When we uh, hit the atmosphere, we're going about 25,000 miles an hour. It's about 5,000 degrees during re-entry, and the crew's got to be about three feet above it inside the crew module, so that's really important. Um, all of our, our landing systems, our parachute systems, that slow you down uh, from that 25,000 miles an hour down to you know landing speeds. And currently, a, a small capsule with a few seats is, the, is one of the best ways to do that. Now, whether that's the case in the future, I'm not so sure and SpaceX are touting that their Starship vehicle can kind of replace this capability. They can bring the whole thing back through the atmosphere with, uh, with humans on board and kind of end the need for captures. But for the time being, we don't have another way to get humans back through the atmosphere. Well, Orion specifically is built for, for a crew of four. I had the privilege of having some of the Apollo astronauts here with us uh, not too long ago, and they were kidding each other, saying, hey, what would we do with all this space that we have, right? It's, it's significantly bigger uh, inside, gives the crew a lot more volume to live and work in. Back in Apollo, your, your wristwatch today probably has more computing power than we had trying to land on the moon back then. So uh, computer systems have come so far, it's very autonomous compared to Apollo spacecraft. Uh, things like the solar arrays that you see behind me, right? Apollo um, had fuel cells and they were limited by the fuel that you could bring to generate power. Uh, with the solar arrays and the technology we have today, we have unlimited power as long as we have sunlight with the Artemis One mission. It's the first mission of an Orion spacecraft on the rocket uh, all together. And then we're just gonna send it uncrewed, make sure everything works um, before we put our friends in it. And uh, we have some test mannequins that are flying in Artemis One with some radiation sensors on it where we'll monitor the data as we fly. The mission will go out about 40,000 miles beyond the moon. Uh, we'll spend anywhere between 20 and 40 days out there depending on exactly what day we launch. The physics kind of dictates how long you can stay. That will give us all the data we need to, to prove that the rocket and the spacecraft work well to put our friends on for Artemis II. That is part one of our series on Artemis. We'll bring you part two very soon. Before we go, last night's feature report focused on a sensitive subject, menstruation. We told you about groups who are trying to lift the stigma around periods. We asked a few folks visiting Rockefeller Plaza why they think this topic is taboo. Because people around you are not talking about it, then you're also quite quiet. The men, they don't want to talk about this because for her, for them it's not like, I don't know, it's not a problem. A lot of times parents don't really communicate with their children about that. So when the communication lines aren't open, I feel like it kind of puts that taboo on it. 
Well said, and we are going to keep the communication lines open on this subject in upcoming reports. But thanks to those of you who shared your thoughts on part one. Thank you for the insightful information on the period piece towards the end of this evening. Even in my mid-30s, up until two years ago, I still was so embarrassed to put on a pad because of the noise it would make in the restroom. And one day I finally thought, all these women bleed too. They know what I'm doing. Why am I flushing the toilet and trying to hide sound? Wow. I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the piece about the menstrual cycle. I was just recently speaking with one of my friends and we realized that in fifth grade when we learned sexual education, there was nothing about the menstrual cycle. Maybe there was, but it was very brief. And even now, at the age of 21, I'm just really learning the full phases of the menstrual cycle. It's more than just periods. It's more than just blood. It's more than that. And it's really important for women to know that. Kimberly, Caitlin, thank you so much. We'll have part two of our series next week, but you can send me your thoughts on this or any of the stories we covered tonight. We're at NBC Now Tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us, nowtonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thank you for making time for us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.